In 1999, there was an accident at a factory that manufactures fuel for nuclear power plants. The uranium that is used to create this fuel began an uncontrolled nuclear reaction, emitting extreme levels of gamma and neutron radiation. The employees who were standing close to the reaction were affected the most, being exposed to levels of radiation much higher than what is considered lethal. They would be rushed to a hospital and receive extensive care, but would eventually succumb to the effects of radiation sickness, their skin literally melting off and their bodies being liquefied from the inside. This is the story of the Tokai Mura JCO nuclear accident. The event takes place in Japan, in the city of Tokai, located a few hundred kilometers north of Tokyo. Tokai City's core industry was nuclear power, with 15 major nuclear facilities employing over one-third of the city's population. One of these facilities was owned by a company called JCO, which created nuclear reactor fuel rods for neighboring power plants. JCO had been performing poorly financially for a few years, and management was under pressure to increase profit margins. They attempted to do this by cutting corners in the process of manufacturing their nuclear fuel. The proper process involved mixing uranium oxide into nitric acid inside what is called a dissolution tank, creating uranyl nitrate. This mixture would then be pumped into a buffer tank, which would slowly add the mixture to a precipitation tank, where ammonia would be added to create the final product. A key component of the process is the buffer tank, which serves two purposes. First, it regulates the rate that the uranium solution is added to the precipitation tank, preventing an excessive amount to be dumped in too quickly. Second, the geometry of the buffer tank, being tall and thin, prevents an unintentional nuclear reaction, whereas the short and wide structure of the precipitation tank increases the chances of a reaction being triggered. JCO would later alter this process, first by having the employees mix the uranium oxide and nitric acid in a bucket by hand, rather than using the dissolution tank. Second, they would remove the buffer tank altogether, and have employees simply dump the solution they mixed in the bucket directly into the precipitation tank. Keep in mind that the employees were not wearing any kind of protective gear while doing this. JCO would make these changes without receiving any kind of approval from regulatory authorities. Some staff members would express concerns regarding this change in procedure, but management told them it would be fine. Just don't spill the contents of the bucket. The employees at the facility were regular blue-collar workers, not nuclear physicists, so they didn't know exactly what kind of danger they were being exposed to and had to take their boss's word. The new simplified process worked without problem for some time, mainly due to the plant usually handling enriched uranium with a low concentration, less than 5%. This gave the company a false sense of security. However, in 1999, JCO received an order for nuclear fuel to be used at the Joyo Experimental Fast Breeder Reactor which required uranium enriched to 18.8%, more than three times the usual concentration. On September 30th, 1999, three employees, Hisashi Ouchi, Masato Shinohara, and Yutaka Yokokawa, were preparing a batch of this fuel. Under pressure from management to create the fuel as fast as possible, they decided to dump large amounts of the uranium solution into the precipitation tank. As they were pouring the seventh bucket into the tank, they saw a bright blue flash emitted from the solution inside. At this point, there was 40 liters of the solution in the precipitation tank, adding up to almost 16 kilograms worth of uranium, almost seven times the mass recommended in established guidelines. This triggered a criticality event, a nuclear chain reaction emitting intense gamma and neutron radiation. To put it simply, 
The situation that the three employees in that room were in was similar to standing next to an active nuclear reactor. Ouchi, who had his body pressed against the tank, suffered the most exposure, followed by Shinohara, who was pouring the bucket from above. They both experienced pain, nausea, difficulty breathing, and would lose consciousness within a few minutes. Sensors across the facility picked up extreme levels of radiation, sending off alarms and notifying authorities. Residents of the surrounding area were told to evacuate, and Ouchi, Shinohara, and Yokokawa were rushed to a hospital by emergency services who arrived on scene. The immediate concern was how to stop the nuclear reaction. At first, JCO employees were understandably reluctant to go in a room with intense levels of radiation, but eventually a total of 18 men volunteered for the task. They would go in as teams of two, each team responsible for carrying out a small task, as they could not stay in the room for more than 60 seconds to avoid radiation sickness. Seven of the 18 volunteers exceeded their 60 seconds and were exposed to levels of radiation higher than the recommended limit. But their efforts paid off, and the nuclear reaction was contained 20 hours after it had begun. The situation at the factory had been taken care of, but the struggle had just started for the three employees who had suffered the most amount of radiation. As they arrived at the hospital, it became clear just how much radiation they had been exposed to. Ouchi had been exposed to 16,000 to 20,000 millisieverts. Shinohara exposed to 6,000 to 10,000. And Yokokawa exposed to 1,000 to 4,500. For reference, the fatality rate is 50% for people who are exposed to 3,000 millisieverts. And over 99% for those exposed to over 6,000. So from the start, the situation was dire for Ouchi and Shinohara, while Yukokawa had a slim chance of survival. On the day of the incident, Ouchi appeared to be somewhat okay, as claimed by the medical staff who took care of him. ま、しかしあの帯びてて、However, further examinations would prove that Ouchi's situation was much worse than what could be seen on the surface. Tests revealed the powerful radiation had pierced Ouchi's body and had destroyed his chromosomes. Chromosomes are DNA molecules that contain the genetic information of an organism. The body uses this genetic information as a kind of blueprint to create new cells to maintain bodily functions. For example, us humans shed a little bit of skin every day. But because we create new skin cells, the layer of skin protecting our bodies is maintained. If the body loses the ability to create new skin cells, our skin would eventually shed away, exposing the inner flesh. If you compare normal chromosomes to Ouchi's, you can clearly see how much damage the radiation did. Some of his chromosomes are severed, some are fused together, depriving his body of the ability to regenerate cells. Shinohara's situation was no better. 
Because his face and hands had been directly exposed to the uranium solution, his condition on day one was visibly worse than that of Ouchi, and his chromosomes had also been destroyed. The first effect of radiation poisoning to appear was the loss of white blood cells. White blood cells protect the body from foreign bacteria and diseases, a vital component of the body's immune system. Ouchi and Shinohara's white blood cells had dropped to almost zero, and they were moved to sterile rooms to prevent infection. Doctors decided that the best treatment was to transplant cells that create white blood cells from a healthy donor. In the case of Ouchi, his sister volunteered to be the donor. Blood was extracted from his sister over the course of nine hours and transplanted to Ouchi. It would take a couple weeks for the doctors to see if this treatment would succeed. However, another problem began to materialize in the meantime. As previously mentioned, without the ability to regenerate cells, your skin will begin to erode. And this was beginning to happen to Ouchi. As medical staff took off medical instruments attached to his body with surgical tape, chunks of skin would come off with it. Doctors would try to patch this up with graft skin and bandages, but this was only a temporary solution. He had also lost most of his hair, and his body was visibly breaking down. To make the situation worse, it was not only his outer skin that was deteriorating, the inner lining of his lungs were also beginning to fall apart, causing a buildup of fluids, making it difficult for him to breathe. おじさん、多分その頃はすごいいろいろ体体の悪さとかが出てきて でも、家族にそういうことを伝えたということが大内さんはどんな気持ちで奥さんにその一言を言ったんだろうと思うとお吠えましいと思いながらもなんかあほなんて言えばいいんでしょう大内さんの伝えたかったことがその一言に。Eventually, it became so difficult for him to breathe that doctors had to insert a medical instrument into his windpipe. This would supply him with enough air to stay alive, but would also deprive him of the ability to speak. Eighteen days had passed since the incident, and doctors were ready to test Ochi's blood to examine if the cells transplanted from his sister were functioning. To everyone's pleasant surprise, they were. The pink dots in this image represent cells transplanted from his sister, and they were reproducing inside of his body. あの、a week later, doctors noticed an anomaly in the chromosomes of the cells transplanted from Ochi's sister. Due to the sheer amount of radiation he had been exposed to, Ochi's body itself had become radioactive. This radiation emitted by Ochi's own body was destroying the chromosomes of his sister's cells, making it unlikely that this treatment will be a permanent solution. As time progressed, more symptoms would begin to appear. 
This is an image of his intestines. The white areas are where his mucous membranes were beginning to die. Eventually, blood would flow out of areas where his membranes had died, causing massive internal bleeding and diarrhea. The condition of his skin was also getting worse. By this time, the majority of his skin had been lost, and his entire body was covered in bandages. <laughs> もう本当に半日かかるぐらいなんですね。午前中いっぱいとか、もうたくさんの先生に囲まれて、あの日々の処置をするんですけど、もうそれがすごくやっぱり痛いみたいで、もうその時は完全に薬をたくさん使って、あ
Eighty-three days after the incident, Ouchi departed this world. His colleague, Shinohara, was not doing much better. Although Shinohara's symptoms were progressing slower due to him receiving less radiation than Ouchi, it was only a matter of time until he met the same fate. On April 27th of the next year, he would pass away, 211 days after the incident. The third employee, Yokokawa, also had his white blood cell levels drop to near zero at one point, but made a miraculous recovery, and was allowed to leave the hospital one day before Ouchi died. ま、JCO as a company would be found guilty in court and be forced to pay a fine, as well as being stripped of their permit to operate in manufacturing of nuclear fuel. Even to this day, if you open up the homepage of JCO, they have an official apology for the 1999 incident on the top of their front page. Several members of JCO management were also found guilty, with varying sentences. On the government side, stricter regulation and enforcement of regulations would be put in place by the government to prevent similar accidents from happening in the future. However, Japan would suffer yet another major nuclear accident a decade later, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, an incident I will cover in another video. Thank you for watching until the end. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss the next video. I'll see you next time.